conversation is going round. People talking about the colors come to town. Fresh out of the summer breeze, she'll take you by surprise. Hello, this is Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. This week, we're going to talk with Sue Reynolds. Now, this is a show that we taped a while ago. Due to COVID-19, the studios of Whistle FM are currently closed. So I'm going to play you something that we recorded last year around this time. Sue is an author and a therapeutic writer. So this is part one of a two-part series. Today, we'll talk about what is involved in becoming an author, how it is to write your first novel, how Sue got started as a successful novelist and has made writing her career. So how did she get started? In the second episode, which will air on Friday morning at 10 o'clock on Whistle FM, we'll talk about therapeutic writing, the beauty of writing for yourself, and all the wonderful things that it can provide you. During this uncertain time of COVID-19 pandemic, writing can be a really great way to express what you can't say out loud. For today, we're going to start with how to become a novelist, how to take that first step to becoming a an author. We have joining us Sue Reynolds of Ink Slingers. Let's learn a little bit about you. You're an author, you're a writing therapist, I would say, and a therapist in general, but specifically for writing. And how did this all happen? I mean, did you wake up one morning as a little kid and say, I like writing and I'm going to be an author one day? Because some people do that. (laughs) That actually is very similar to how it happened in um, grade two. I used to, when everybody else was, you know, doing their math homework and so on, I'd scoot through it, finish early, and I'd be reading under my desk, right? Because I just loved (laughs) chapter books. And one day I kind of, you know, the neurons connected and I thought, oh my God, somebody has to create these. Somebody has to actually write these. That's what I'm going to (laughs) do. So really and truly, it started when I was about eight. And for the next um, 20 years, I would say, I wrote, um, you know, mostly for exploration, for pleasure. Um, I did, when I was in my early 20s, I thought, you know, I'll write a Harlequin. So I did that. It was a practice book. Um, But when I was... We could say that about all Harlequins. We won't go there. (laughs) Yeah. Um, when I was 28, I started writing the book that would be eventually published when I was 35. It was a young adult fantasy called Strandia. Um, and when it was published that year, it won the uh, Canadian Library Association's um, Young Adult Book of the Year. So Wow. Yeah. And how old were you at the time? 35. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that neat? Yeah, but I started it when I was 28. So, you know, those projects often take years and years, right? Yeah, life gets in the way and... You know, I've I've known a number of authors who write a book that I think is fantastic, and then three years later they're still writing that same book that I thought was fantastic on my first read. So, you're all perfectionists to a point, right? Yeah, and and of course the publishing process takes a while too, right? If you're working mm-hmm. with a traditional publisher, so I think I think I was accepted for publication by Harper Collins for that book when I was maybe. 32, but you know, it was three years before it got through the editing process, the, the publishing got into the lineup, you know, went through the sales process, the promotion process, all of that, and ended up That's actually a on this whole big thing in itself, isn't it? It is. And it's changed a lot over the years. The, the publishing industry. Yeah, we're in a whole different world right now, right? With digital publishing, with access to print on demand. I mean, somebody can write a book, get it up on CreateSpace and Amazon and, you know, and sell it a copy at a time. Um, you don't have to go through traditional publishing anymore. Although, I always tell people if they're writing a novel, a book of fiction, it's much better to try and go with a traditional publisher because they have the sales force, they have the distribution system. It's very hard to market a, a fictional book on your own with a lot of success. Mm-hmm. We had a, a person who has their own business doing um, small run productions, mm-hmm. and sort of self, somewhere between self-publishing and really going to a real publisher. And interestingly enough, she was saying that now a lot of the big publishing houses are scouting the digital world. It's true. Yep. Again, yep. just a strange turn of events, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, that the digital world does a lot of the research for them, right? If somebody is able to successfully market themselves as a fictional author, 
sorry, not a, a, a writer of fiction, not a fictional author, yeah. uh, um, a writer of fiction, you know, through that whole self-publishing world, then they've probably got the content and the cred and the following to do really well in traditional publishing. Mm-hmm. And well, it's that old power of word of mouth advertising. Sure. You know, I have a network of people at the cottage, a little group of us that we, every year we get together at the annual cottage barbecue and all we talk about is what books we've read mm-hmm. over the last year. And we share the titles, we share the authors, we send each other emails and now we're all listening to talking books because when we're driving to the cottage, nothing kills a two and a half hour drive better than a great book Fantastic. being read to you while you drive. I love it. Is so, there somewhere we can subscribe to that list that you uh, <laughs> put oh, together yeah. every year? You know what? It is a fabulous <laughs> list and there are things on the list that I would never normally pick up and it's so it's amazing the power of word of mouth is still so great it's the one tells two tells five tells ten you know right. that's how it goes yeah absolutely interesting okay so now you're a published author but you did other things at school you didn't you did psychology and you've done other studies in your life not just literature and writing that, that's a late in life thing actually i went back to school for psychology um in my 40s back to university wow good for um, you and i did that because um okay it's a long story i'll try and make it quick you so, don't have to so i i wrote the first book it had as i said some success and then i also had a baby at the same time my only child uh, was born at the same time my book was published so suddenly i had very little time to work on my writing yeah and, i would say <laughs> yeah and that puts incredible pressure on you right like if yes. you're if you're writing for fun the way i did as a child and as a young adult um it doesn't matter but when you've had a successful book published and you're trying to get your second book together and you've only got like you know an hour and a half a day when you're awake and the baby's asleep um it's really, there was so much pressure on it. And I, I just kind of froze. I didn't know what to do. So I started studying writing more intensely and I went and worked with Natalie Goldberg. Do you know her? No. Writing, writing down the bones. Mm. She's a, a Zen Buddhist and she applies the principles of writing meditation to, or sorry, of, of, um, Zen meditation to writing as a practice. Hmm. So I went and studied with her a few times, and when I came back from New Mexico the last time, I thought, I really need a community in Ontario to do this with. And this was long before, you know, the, the writing organizations were as prolific as they are now. So um, I began offering workshops in the writing practice method, and and then through that connected to, with the writers' community of Durham region, and, you know, got very involved with them, started the writer's writing community of um, York Region, um, fostered the writing community of Simcoe County. And it just it just kind of proliferated, and I'm getting off topic. So, um, so you've got all these writing groups. You've got a baby. You're trying to write a book, and I imagine if it's just been published, you're trying to promote the book that you just had published. Yeah, well, <coughs> yeah, me. that promotion cycle is actually pretty quick. You know, you've got kind of three months, and then again, as a fictional author, if if you haven't done the work in three months, you you have to do the work in three months that you're going to do to promote a book with a traditional publisher because then they're on to the next their the next, next lineup. Thing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the promotion wasn't a huge thing. I continued to do that. You know, in a desultory way for over the next couple of years, I'd go and do readings at libraries and with book clubs and so on. But yeah, the promotion wasn't a big thing. The big thing was how was I going to get my next book written? So I started studying it. Oh, I know. I know where I'm going. You asked me about how I got into teaching and so on. So that was the beginning of the workshops. And then I continued to take workshops. I'm probably the biggest writing workshop junkie you've ever met. <laughs> Um, we were talking, and then I discovered Pat Schneider. That was about, uh, I think my last Natalie Goldberg workshop was in 1998. And I discovered Pat Schneider's first book called, uh, The Writer is an Artist shortly thereafter. And in 2002, I went and did the certification in the Amherst Writers and Artists method that she developed years and years ago, mm-hmm. which I can talk about at length as well. So anyway, that's that that's that's how I got into writing and teaching writing. I know. The first workshop I ever taught in the writing practice method. Um there was a man there, he was a friend of a friend, he was a lawyer from Toronto. I, I didn't know him at all. And you know, we did writing on the spot together to prompts and then I asked for a volunteer to read and he offered to read and he stood up 
he began to read. It was the simplest story about driving there that morning and about where he'd come from and how um, people in Scarborough, you know, the, the women hung out in the kitchens and the men hung out in the garages and smoked. And he, he just burst into tears. He started crying in front of, you know, the 30 people in the workshop, right? And I was like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to support him in this. Um, but I realized at that moment that, uh, that writing together is a very powerful tool. So, you know, a, a, a psychological tool. Mm-hmm. And that's when I began getting interested in writing for therapeutic benefit. And eventually I went back to school for psychology. I made therapeutic writing my specialty. Um, wow. I did, I have become, um, over, you know, the, the years through my, um, BSc and my MA, a, a psychotherapist. And I use writing extensively in my practice with my clients. Isn't that something? Well, we have to take our first little break. Jay, play some ads for us and pay some bills here at the station. And when we come back, we'll continue our discussion with Sue Reynolds. Stay tuned. You're listening to Fresh Waves. Hey, everyone. This is Lil Jay. Join me every Saturday night at 11 p.m. Eastern for The Block Party, a two-hour journey of the best in the Canadian underground dance music scene. The Block Party, Saturday nights at 11 p.m. Eastern, right here on 102.9 Whistle FM. We're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. We're speaking with Sue Reynolds of Ink Slingers about writing. We're going to be talking this morning about all kinds of different aspects of writing, um, one in particular is is becoming a novelist, and we know that from a young age you wanted to be a writer, Sue, and there's a lot of people who've always had that thought. Then they wake up one morning and think, today's the day I'm going to start writing my book. I've mm-hmm. written my own novel about eight million times, okay, eight million and three, as I walk when I'm walking my dogs or when I'm doing my Nordic pole walking and I'm by myself, the story starts to unfold. I can see the characters, the places. I've got everything all laid out. The ending's a little dicey, but actually the ending is actually okay. It's the middle part that's a little dicey. <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of people like that, I think. The next great novelist is sitting on the subway right next to you in the morning on your way to work or something mm. like that. So how did you actually make that a reality? You're talking about writing my own novel? Yeah. Um, I just... Uh, you were on a mission to do that all along, like through I, uh, school and high school and everything? Did you think, I'm going to be a writer? Uh, oh, yeah. It was, I'm going to be a writer. And, you know, and as I say, lots of sort of practice writing, lots of short stories. Lots, and, of course, I was also a phenomenal reader. I just gobbled books. And I have to say, for anybody who wants to write, I think that's one of the most valuable things you can do is just read widely. Mm-hmm. Um, but the actual novel that I ended up, you know, finishing and publishing um, came, my husband and I were sitting with my younger sister at that point, and uh, he he looked at my younger sister, whose name is uh, Sandy, and said, Sand of Strandia. And we just started. Who would that character be? Where would where would they come from? What was going on in their lives? And uh, originally, we thought we would write it together, but they, you know, lost interest very quickly. But I was really taken with the character, so I wrote the whole book. Yeah, isn't that neat? So, so that's how it's. But I, I also, I'm a binge writer. I have a really crazy busy life, so I have to set aside, you know, periods of time. So I would write on vacations. I would write on, you know, weekend retreats. Um, but I'm not one of those people who gets up every morning and goes to my desk and produces, you know, a steady three pages a day. I should be, but I'm not. <laughs> So. Yeah, I don't know if that's a should be sort of thing. I think everybody works in different ways, don't they? They do, but I, I have to say that most prolific novelists I know, that's the way they work. They really they have a very steady you know, this the tortoise, right? Slow and steady. Okay. I'll have to ask you something that's always been on my mind. I've I read these great books, whether it's Diana Gabaldon or even um J. K. Rawlings. You, you you read these stories that are long. J.K. Rowling said she wrote all the stories in her head before she divided them into books. Mm. So you you could think if you put all those five books together, they're this massive, massive amount of reading. And the characters are the same throughout the books. 
how do you leave those characters and go mm. make dinner and become a regular person who's driving a kid to whatever activity or going out and socializing with your friends? I mean, as a reader, I'm socializing with my friends thinking, wow, I wonder what Jamie Fraser's doing today. Or I wonder what Claire's doing. Or I wonder what Harry's doing or Hermione. You, you know, you get these characters in your head as a reader and you can't get rid of them. And when the book ends, I, I don't cry because it's a sad ending. I cry because what are they going to do? Don't, don't leave me. Right. I, I want to know what you're doing right it's till over. the very end. <laughs> yeah. I don't want this book to end. So as a, as a writer, how do you leave those characters behind and, and live a life while you're writing? <laughs> um, I think most writers find it very difficult to leave characters they're attached to. I, I actually do a writing residential retreat every summer with the same group of writers. And this year, one of the writers was working on a, a book. It's a steampunk book. The characters are just so... Well, they're very much like the Harry Potter characters you just mm-hmm. talked about, right? They they feel by the end of the book like you know them intimately. They're quirky. They're fun. Um, and he said, I, I, I find myself getting depressed. I don't, I don't want to leave them. Um, but the other thing you started to say was about, you know, how do you, how do you become a normal person when you're writing? You know, you're, yeah. you're, you're working with these characters every day and then you have to leave it and drive your kids around. And again, you know, so there's the, um, there's the case for writing every day. Because if you, if you do write every day, it's sort of like your brain is split. You know, on, on the one hand, you're constantly kind of with them, right? You go back to them every day and, um, you don't, you don't drop it. They don't disappear. They're constantly kind of chattering over here in your head while you're living your real life. And then you return to them every morning. But if you leave those characters for a month or two or a year mm-hmm. and you come back, you find them all sitting silently in a room with their arms crossed looking at you like, <laughs> What? What? Like you left us and now, now you want to talk to us? I don't think so. <laughs> you have to get to know us all over again. Exactly. And, um, one writer I, I, I was talking to, she'd just come into a class and everybody was going around and talking about, you know, what it was they wanted to do. And she said her writing felt like a rusty tap, right? It was like, yeah. and <laughs> I think that's a great, one of the best descriptions I've ever heard of like trying to get back to your writing when you've been away for it, from it for a while. Yeah. It does sound like a a really difficult task in this fast paced day and age. Mm-hmm. And even in the movies now, I find a lot of movies or a lot of television shows, the character development isn't nearly what it used to be in older writings. People want little tidbits and they want it fast. Commercials when they first started were two minutes or one minute. Then they went down to 30 seconds, then 15, now 10, and sometimes less than five when you're on a YouTube thing looking. It's got, this This will end in four, three, two, one. You can cancel it now, and everyone does. So they've got five seconds to get their message across. Right. I've read books that have been published where the chapters are one and a half pages or two pages and then you're on to a different, it's back to a different story, then on to the next story, then back to the different one. And I just, it's weird. But it seems to be a sign of the times that people like their information quick and down and dirty, as opposed to a long, lengthy war and peace. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that this is a culture that's developed a shorter attention span. But, you know, I mean, you can turn it around and say there's something fabulous to be learned from that. I think that's why there's so much emphasis now in uh, when you're presenting your manuscript to a publisher on the hook, right, on the, the opening. And does it grab the reader right away? Because we are a culture... You know, people will buy their books that way. They'll pick them up in the bookstore, or look at the first page, and if there isn't something there that gets them into the story, it's like your YouTube um, yes, commercial. You know, commercial video. Or, you know, Amazon online. You you click on the, the icon, and usually you can read the first few pages, right? So again, mm-hmm. you know, the, you've got to grab your reader right away. Yeah, it's an interesting phenomenon, because I can remember reading books that I've been thinking a uh, third third chapter in all right someone's got to start happening soon and then when it does the first three chapters all of a sudden make all the sense and the book just takes off Mm -hmm. it's it's walking along like a little bird and then all of a sudden the wings come out and wow does it go but it was a struggle getting through the first couple of chapters 
And if you're a first time novelist, you know, the chances of you being published with that kind of book with that very slow start are quite slim. Mm-hmm. This nowadays, I guess that would be the case. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, Jay, time for our next little break. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue our our topic about um, how to be the novelist, you know, how to take it from sitting at the dock thinking of the story to <laughs> actually writing it down. You're listening to Fresh Waves. I'm Bren, your host, and we'll be back right after this. Stay tuned. And we're back on Fresh Waves. I'm your host, Bren Masson. We're talking with Sue Reynolds about writing. You are an author, and you had that desire since you were really young. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of people have never considered themselves to be writers, but after a summer of sitting outside, whether it's at the cottage or at home, and reading, because that's a a really big summer pastime. I mean, the bookstores even market it as great summer reading. Um, Now they might be thinking... I do have a story that I want to write. I want to become a novelist. How does it go from that thought of, huh, that would be a cool story, to actually getting it on the paper? Well, the first thing you have to do is what we call bum and chair, right? You actually have to <laughs> put your ass on the chair cushion, you know, get the, get your pen in your hand and your notebook open or your keyboard open in front of you and commit to the writing and so many people actually never even get that far, right? They, they, they think they want to write. Well, they know they want to write, but the, the idea of committing to it, putting it on the paper or on the um, screen, where it could be read by somebody else, is terrifying. Um, I, I always say that who we are as writers, or, or the way we are on the page, is actually very much the way we are in real life. It's incredible to me how. People's writing um, so often echoes their personality. The way they engage with the mm. act of writing is very much the way they engage with life. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, Cheryl McLean was here, right? Yes. Cheryl is a, a no-holds-barred, go-for-the-guts writer. She's very, very brave on the page. And, as you know, you said you were in Costa Rica with her helping set up. She's that way in real life, too. Right. Yeah, Isn't that, that is interesting because she is that way. <laughs> hey, Cheryl, I know you're listening this morning. Nice <laughs> to have you listening from Costa Rica. Um, okay, so normally in everyday life, a person says, oh, that dripping tap is driving me nuts. They get up, they walk across the room, they turn it off. When you're writing that down, there has to be a whole descriptive process in that that doesn't take place in the normal talking it through in your head Mm -hmm. it's the painting of the picture right um so you know you say how how does someone start i mean um one of the things we do in writing workshops is we'll often offer a prompt a way for somebody to get into the writing right and they don't actually even have to know where they want to go I mean, they can start with a completely uh, tabula rasa, uh, completely open, or they can start with this idea, um, I want to have, uh, I have these two characters in mind, a mother and daughter, and I want them to have a key fight, but they don't know how to get into it. So you just offered that um, tap, right? Sometimes a prompt I'll offer will be something that is uh, very sensory based. So I might say, um, start with the sound of water dripping. And somebody will be writing about a little creek, a little freshet. Somebody will be writing about a, you know, a tap that won't shut up. Um, you know, and they'll have this sound, plink, plink, plink. And then before you know it, you've got the character's irritation. And then that irritation spills into her thinking about her mother. And then her mother comes in the room. And then suddenly they're in dialogue. And But, you know, it's the sensory detail can be the way in, right? Mm-hmm. The, way, um, the way the sun feels on the top of your head. Um, the sound, a sound of, you know, leaves rustling, a sound of car tires, uh, making that ripping sound on, on a wet road outside your window. I mean, you can start anywhere, but as soon as you begin to capture the sensations of the world, the way they show up in your mind, you're also communicating that to your reader. They've done, um, PET scans of people's brains when they are, for instance, looking at a red apple. 
and a certain part of their brain lights up. There's more activity there. Then they have them close their eyes and imagine the red apple, and the same part of their brain gets active and lights up. Yeah. Not to the same degree, but the same part of the brain. So the thing is, somebody who is imagining something sensory has the experience of that sensory thing, even if they're not, you know, actually engaging with it. So as a writer, a big part of your job is to make the world light up in their brains in a way that they're right inside the the sensory experience. That's a really interesting thought, because that's exactly what happens when you read good writing. Exactly. There's other times when you're reading something that's really not catching my attention, or I'll be reading something that's just like, there's, there's, there's just an element missing, and it's a layered effect almost. There's the, the character development, which we could talk about for probably four hours, because every writer, I think, has to be a people watcher and a psychologist in many ways, because they have to be delving into the minds of the characters that they're creating. But they also have to be really good at painting the picture of where they are, what they're doing, how they're feeling, what's going on. And there's a big difference. We were talking at the break about sort of the difference between anecdote and writing, right? Mm -hmm. So in anecdote, we tend to tell things a certain way we we tell them very much from our perspective and then that's a given in conversation and we i mean the operative word is tell we report but we don't make it come alive the way we were just talking about on the page mm-hmm. right and if you if you tried to do that in conversation it would just seem weird but the thing is that when you uh report anecdotes on the page that also just seems weird. It seems flat. There's a lot of ath- authorial intrusion. Like you can feel the author in there invested in the way you react to something. And that's really irritating as a reader, right? You want to encounter the world that the author has created, but you want to be able to make your own decisions about it. You want to experience it. And so when the, the mother, you know, comes in and bangs her coffee cup down on the counter so hard that the coffee splashes out. Um, you're just presented with that fact, right? As a reader, you're reading it and you're thinking, oh, she's really irritated. But there's nothing actually more... Um, um, what's the word? It, um, divisive, more separating, more arm's length than having the author say she was really irritated. You're like, don't tell me how she's feeling. Let me see what she's doing. Let me hear how she's talking to her daughter. And I'll figure out how irritated she is. Mm -hmm. It's like a person in real life coming up to you and saying, I'm really irritated. (laughs) Yeah. You probably didn't need to say that because your facial expression (laughs) just says it all. Exactly. You know, what do they say? That that, um, something like 85% of our conversation... Is not con- is not transmitted verbally. It's through our facial expression, the tone of our voice, the the our body language, the way we stand or sit or lean. And as a a writer, you have to recreate that on the page without swamping your reader in details. So mm-hmm. you have to give just enough that they can pick up the cues, the subtext we call it, right? Um, and uh, and understand what's going on without having the author interfere and tell you this is how you should feel about what's going on this is how you this is how this person is feeling this is how this person is feeling this is what's going on between them emotionally there's nothing that'll kill a story faster than being told how to feel about something that's interesting because i've never noticed that before but now that you say it that's true you want to have your own take on it i think that's why um if you read a book and then see the movie (laughs) first of all the movie is usually way shorter than the book. It's Mm -hmm. like the Reader's Digest condensed version, which you know is never the best interpretation of anything. Um, No offense to Reader's Digest condensed book lovers, but it really isn't. If you really want, if you're liking that condensed version, read the whole book. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And in the movies, I'll often say to my kids, because they're watching a movie that I've already read the book of, I'll say, it's a little different in the book. Yeah. Oh, well, Mom, you know, books are always different. Yeah, that's true. But in the book, even though the character is described, I have my own vision of what they look like. Right. And even though the setting is described, I have my own vision of what that castle looks like or what that playground looks like. Quidditch, in my mind, was so different than Quidditch. And the only reason I'm using the Harry Potter books is because they're so, they're so widely read that most people have 
read the books or seen the movie. But the game was wonderfully created in the movie, but not the way I had it in my mind, I can honestly say. Right. Well, and, and that's the other thing, too. Once you're presented with the the concrete version of it in, in movies, you know, you're given the sight sounds. Mm-hmm. Um, you c- I, For me, anyway, I can never unlearn that, right? Like, now Harry Potter is that movie actor. Yes. You know? Ron is the movie actor. Hermione. Yeah. I, I, and yet, I know that they were looked very different in my mind the first time I read the books. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And th- and there's also, I don't know, do you have this? There's a kind of magical feeling that happens in my chest when I'm reading reading a really good book and the world is alive and I'm engaging with there's, I, I don't even know how to, else to describe it. It's uh, it's this evanescent engagement with the story. It it's somehow all mine even though, you know, whoever reads the book, I mean, it's also all theirs, right? But but it's my version of it in my body, in my mind. And that leeches away somehow when a book is made into a movie, for me. I mean, yeah, I, I can never get it too. back. And I, it's funny that you said in your chest, because that's where I feel it, too. In my chest and in my core. It's just this this world that somehow is all mine. Mm-hmm. And even though someone else has already read the book, my thrill i get a kick out of somebody who has the same interpretation as i do Mm -hmm. because someone else can read it and have a totally different take on it but when someone has to say it's like really yeah you got that too isn't that cool yeah (laughs) it's really kind of a neat thing especially if the book gives you the space to grow it Mm -hmm. you know what i mean there are some books that are written where everybody who read it will probably have exactly the same impression of what went on and how it was all presented but there are other books that really give you space, space to be and create your own little world out of it. Mm-hmm. Neil Gaiman's good at that, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> His dark underworld. I think we could sit down in a room of 50 people and everybody would have a different impression of what the characters really look like in their own minds and, and what the space looks like in the in the world that he creates. It's That's a gift, too, in its own way. But there's a lot of people who don't like that. A lot of people who don't like the 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 vastness of it and would rather have it more condensed so that they could they can understand it more simply yeah um you know Mar- margaret atwood has this book about writing called negotiating with the dead and <laughs> yeah genius and um and she has this wonderful um she talks for a while about how an author has a contract with the work right and and people think that the author has a contract with the reader. She says, it's not, it's not true. The author has a contract with the work. The reader has a contract with the work. Um, and those two things are separate tracks. The, the third uh, leg of the triangle isn't ever met, right? So, Interesting. When the, so the author writes the world the way they imagine it. The reader experiences the world they imagine it. Of course, it's gonna, they're going to engage with the story based on everything they know about the world, the way they've experienced their life, and of course that's why you were talking about people having the same experience of the book, but I often also find that people have very different experiences mm-hmm. of the book. For sure. That's, um, that's one of the big disappointments when you read a book and you absolutely adore it and you're focused on certain things and you share it with a friend and, and they say, ah, no, I don't know, it didn't really do it for me. <laughs> you know? Um I just, yeah. Cheryl and I are like that on a lot of books that we, we like, or I'll say, there's some that we both adore, some authors that we both adore, and I'll say, oh yeah, one of my favorite books was Blanche. That ah, didn't really cut it for me. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't oh. my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's good because we come from different, I think you come from different life experiences, so different books affect different people in different ways. Yeah, of course, for sure. It, it, to me, it's always amazing how a book can affect so many people when these certain books, like remember the Celestine Prophecy, Mm -hmm. how it exploded into this massive worldwide thing. It's like the Da Vinci Code. And it's it's a phenomenon, I think, that a book can really affect so many people and so profoundly Mm -hmm. where people are racing out to get the next one or racing out to get the one before which actually should have come before the the one right (laughs) you know how that all works right it's a really interesting thing so there's got to be something within that book that really appeals to the masses 
Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because those three, sorry, those two books, and um, I'm just thinking of three sort of phenomenal, phenomenon books. One was The Da Vinci Code, one was The Celestine Prophecies, and one was uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, right? Yes. And interestingly, you know, as a as a reader, as a writer, I found all three books to be not particularly well written. No. But there was something about the story that um, is really engaging for a wide range of, of people. So I'm not quite sure what that tells us in terms of, of writing, except again, I guess you were talking about how does somebody get started. So if you have an idea for a story, um, that that's a very profound place to start because a good story can carry... Me- bad writing. Mediocre <laughs> to bad writing, exactly. Well, I have a friend who's an English teacher, and we were at a backyard barbecue. People were talking about the books that they've read, and someone stood up, and out from underneath the couch, like between the cushions of the couch, fell Fifty Shades oh, of Grey. Oh, no. <laughs> and the woman whose house was, it was, she was so funny. Okay, I'm reading it. I have to admit it. I tried to stuff it underneath the cushions when you guys came in. And it was so funny because she said it was the worst written piece of literature, if you could even call it that, that she's ever, ever read. But because so many people had read it and loved it and kept talking about it, she felt like she had nothing to contribute to the conversations because she'd never read it. So she decided to read it. And I said, you know, I've never read it either. And the English teacher said to me, don't bother. Seriously? Don't bother. Mm -hmm. So I watched the Netflix film and thought, it's interesting. It is a good story. It's an odd story. But again, because the video so broadly covered it and condensed it down, I think I'd have to read the book to figure out what was the big phenomenon in the first place. But I've just never been that interested. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we can talk about the Fifty Shades phenomenon. I, I think it was a whole, as, as books often are when they're wildly successful, it's, it's a whole host of, uh, factors coming together at once. I think it was because it was right around the time that e-readers became really available. Right. So people could read erotica on the subway, you know, in public places without people knowing. Um, I think a lot of people had never had any exposure to written erotica. Um, I, yeah, I'm going to make a crazy broad generalization here and say that I think in terms of um, sexuality that women are probably more interested in relationship and story. Um, you know, uh, with apologies to Jay, you know, <laughs> it's guys who are supporting the porn industry, which right. is which is a very thin storyline, right? right. <laughs> and and women that are supporting the erotica industry, which is you know really broadly based on story. The the sex is there; it's exciting, but it's you know it's only a small part. It sort of keeps raising its ugly head in the, right. <laughs> in the story. Anyway, I, f- I feel like we're wandering way off topic here again. But that's but, okay. It's it's. Um you know, it would be interesting to see if these authors, obviously Dan Brown was an author from the very beginning, but some of these books that create these phenomenons are a one-off. Right. And you've never heard of the author before. You can't find any of their works before because there wasn't any. And you can't find any after because whatever they wrote after really didn't go anywhere. And I think that's what happened with the Celestine Prophecy afterwards is that the books just kind of meh the sensationalistic one was the first one. And so I don't think you need to be afraid of writing that one great novel. Right. When they say that people say they have one great novel, every author has one great novel. For some, it actually is the the same novel just reproduced 50 different times. And for others, it's that one great book. So you don't have to think down the future that you're going to be an Enid Blyton and, and write you know, thousands of books over your lifetime, you you can be the author of just that one novel that's yours. Right. And it does start with that story idea. I mean, the really strong thing about the, the Celestine prophecy was the idea behind it, right? Yes. The, the really, certainly wasn't the writing. The really strong piece of the Da Vinci Code was the idea. Yeah. Um, so if you have an idea for a novel that's come to you, you know, while you're driving or I get all my ideas in the shower, <laughs> you know, while you were sitting on the dock at the cottage, having that cup of coffee, I, the next thing to do is to commit to it. Say, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm intrigued. You don't want to say, you know, I believe in this idea. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. But the, the thing that will get you to the page and keep you faithful is I'm intrigued by this idea. I want to play with it. I want to see where it goes. I want to see what it can become without getting really invested in, you know, I'm going to be the next Dan Brown or the next Stephen King or 
or the next, uh, see, I can't even remember the Fifty Shades author's name. No, My apologies. Can I. Okay. But that, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. You can just write, I and mean, the story doesn't have to be for the world. It can just be for you. Well, that's the thing, right? Writing, I mean, to start with, writing is just a delicious thing to do. To be investigating your own ideas. Um, Writing has its own power. I mean, if you can get your butt in the chair, get your pen on the paper, and begin to surrender to the writing, it will take you places that you would be best not to steer yourself. Like, you don't want to grab hold and, and take the steering wheel and control the idea. It's, um... It is a contract, as Margaret Atwood says, right? You have this idea, Mm -hmm. you begin to explore it on the page, and I can't tell you how often in workshops people will finish a writing, um, a timed writing, and they'll look up, you know, they're they're coming back from a long way away, you can see it in their faces and their eyes, and they laugh and they say, oh my God, I have no idea where this came from, or, you know, oh, this went someplace I wasn't expecting at all, but but it's delicious. It's delightful that that engagement and the um, the, the synthesis that happens with between you know you and the page. You're not steering it; you're discovering, and it's there's so much power and fun in that. Yeah, I, and and that's long before you start layering it with you know I want to publish, I want to get it out there, I want to <laughs> I want to be a best selling author, like just to. To play with that, just to engage with that deliciousness, is the first gift you can give yourself as a writer. That's a, that's a really great way of looking at it, because then it is just for you. Yeah, and and sure, it may get you know it may develop legs, it may go all the way, it may, it may be traditionally published, and you may become a, a best selling author. That's all possible. Right. But but the thing is, if you put that weight on your writing just as you're beginning. And, you know, you're crushed before you ever start out. And every, it's like me, you know, way back when I had my baby and every, and every hour I could eke out with my story had damn well be, better be productive and better be as good as the first one and better be, you know, and it, it just, I just froze. That That's the beginning of, of writer's block. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is, is when you start layering the, your work with expectations right from the very beginning. And expectations that are almost unaccomplished, like just setting yourself up for failure. So heavy. Yeah. So heavy. I mean, you know, lo- I I have a lot of um, people who I facilitate in workshops who get stuck, right? And inevitably, when they're telling me they're blocked, they can't write, and we start paring it down, paring it down, it all gets down to they're waiting, they're, they're freighting their writing with too much expectation. Right. It's all about product. And it's not about process. Right. As long as you can stay deliciously with the process in the first draft. Yeah, um, the shitty first draft. And that's expect right. it to be just that, the shitty first draft. That's right. That You can make your way forward. But if you start layering the expectations on the first draft, you get crushed by those expectations. The, the place for product is the second draft. When you've got that, that loose, rambling, delicious, fun first draft all completed, and then you say, okay, I really like this, I really believe in it, I want to take it farther, I want to polish it up, you know, I want to mm-hmm. shape it, I want to create something that I could send to an agent or a, a publisher. But that second draft work, right? As, yeah. as When somebody gets stuck, it's almost inevitably because they're trying to do second draft work. First time around. In the first draft. Yeah. Right. Okay, so how do, when somebody's got that story, I've always heard... Well, there's a process. So you're going to write, then you have to sit down, you have to have your beginning, your middle, and your end, and you write those three first, and then you fill in the gaps. And I think to myself, that would just kill it for me right there. I wouldn't write a word, because I often don't have the ending. Yeah. And I was reading a novel that I really enjoyed, and at the end I read the author's notes, and he said, this story had no ending when I began. Mm -hmm. It was a thought. What happens if you miss the train? And I thought, wow, that is just fantastic. That's what I got from the book. I never got a formula when it started. Just the fact that the story started and it organically moved from missing the train Mm. and taking that next train that he'd never been on before. I just think, wow, that just opens the door to a myriad of possibilities. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's staying with that delicious discovery, 
right? If, if you, if you ask what if questions and then you sit down with your writing and you discover what if as you're writing it, when, when you, I mean, people are, um, Writers are divided into what we call plotters and pantsers. Plotters are people who, you know, do a very full outline before they ever start and then write to the outline. Um, and, and there can be discovery in small ways, but it, right. you're not going to get a big discovery over the story usually because you've kind of got that worked out. And actually, some plotters will do a kind of um, pantsing, which is what we call writing by the seat of your pants. Right. Um, you know, as they're creating the story outline. Mm -hmm. So, so that's a kind of loose in between thing. Um, pantsers are people like your uh, friend that you were just talking about. You know, what happens if I miss the train or if, if someone misses the train? And then you sit down and you discover what happens. And, um, the challenge around that is that you have to be willing to write a lot because, you know, if you want to write a book in 90 days, and there's, you know, lots of books out there, you know, write your novel in 90 days, um, you pretty much have to stick with a p- uh, plotting um, right. schedule because you have to know where you're beginning, where you're going to go, where you're going to end up. Um, but I will say that often books that are written with that kind of plotting basis um, are, they feel more predictable, they feel... Uh, you know, I can't remember whose quote it is. It says, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Like, if you know where it's going right from the very beginning, the reader often knows where it's going right from the very beginning. And then you get into the whole formulaic thing. Romance novels, you know, where by page 50, this has to have happened, and by page 100, this has to have happened. It's also that Hollywood screenwriter yes. model, right? Yep. I mean, how many Hollywood movies have you seen where... You know exactly, you, you know, you, you think, okay, you know, we're here, we're at seven, 75 mov- minutes into the movie, this is where it's all going too well, something's going to crash immediately, and often from what's come before, you can even predict what's going to go wrong, mm-hmm. right? Whereas, for instance, you watch some English films, some European films, and you never know from one minute to the next what's going to happen, but it's delightful. Absolutely delightful. The first thing that comes to my mind when you said that was The Gods Must Be Crazy. What a great movie, from start to finish. And it was just so unscripted. It was just amazing. When we come back for the second hour, we're going to be talking more about therapeutic writing. This is the writing that you never want to have published. It's the writing that's just for you. It's the writing that helps you express yourself. It's the writing that allows you to say the things that you may not feel safe speaking about in the world around you. But if you allow yourself, you can put it on the page in a special notebook in a special place that's just for you and you alone. Share only if you want. Well, that was part one of our two-part series on writing. Today, we learned some really great tips on how to become an author. On Friday morning at 10, we'll delve into the therapeutic writing, the writing that can be really, really helpful during this COVID-19 pandemic when we find ourselves stuck together in very close quarters or worried about the future, wondering what's to come and often not being able to express ourselves out loud. Writing gives us a whole new avenue. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And remember, you can always catch the podcasts on freshwaves.ca. Tune in Friday morning at 10 for part two. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful day.